It's not that easy. It's very difficult. That is all a lie. It's not true. None of that is true. Because the truth is, it is possible. It has to be done now. God is with you. And what is impossible for you is possible for him. What is your fate? What is it that you're doing? Who are you working with? Are you working with the one that is capable of doing everything? Or are you just trying to pretend to work on your own? See? So this is what is happening. And that's where the devil creeps in. He creeps in placing a process in your life. A process. So he sets you up in time. So that you can lose eternal sense of living. And God is asking us to place ourselves in the eternal sense of living. And to get outside this temporary life and live according to the spirit. That's why St. Paul was saying in Romans, in the letter, live according to the spirit. If you live according to the spirit, you will be placed outside regular natural time. And then you will be in an eternal pace. What a difference. When you are a person that is placed in the eternal presence of God, you're not in a rush, you're not in a process, you are not thinking about doing something. You are on the spot, right there, on it, hands on. And you're moving along with what you have, and you are what you are right now, and you are everything you are right now. You are not placing a piece of you in the future. You are not placing a piece of you in the past that is supposed to be hurt and destroyed. You are completely as a whole right now. And this, this is all you have. You don't have anything else. So you are not in a process. You are not trying. You are not thinking it's hard. You are just completely convinced that all God is asking you is to do it right now and do it with everything you got. Put in everything you got. That's the only way to overcome Satan. Because Satan comes in and gets you divided in your action. So if your intention is to do something that will turn you into a better person and, and better your relationships with people, the relationship with your work and your, and your vocation, and your prayer life and so many other things, you, even, even your physical health, your mental health, he's going to come in and place you in a process. So, and divide the time so that you can be scattered and you think you're doing what you have to do, and, but you don't know that you are all divided and chopping pieces and you are not walking in a unity because you have been divided. So that's why we find so many people wondering about the will of God. And you know, they are lying themselves, right? They lie to themselves. What is the will of God in my life? How could I find that? They don't want the will of God. Otherwise, they wouldn't be asking when the will of God is so clear. You know, the will of God is that we make it home. And the, the only way to make it home is holiness. And we know that. But the devil doesn't want to hear that. You know, I ask many Catholics, If they ever, they have ever, ever, ever asked God to make them saints, to make them holy. And you'll be surprised. 90% of the people you ask, they have never, ever knelt and asked God to make them saints. Imagine that. That's really sad. Because it's like, where are we? You know, it's like, what are we looking for? What is, what is it that we're doing? How could it be that we live this faith? And we have never been on our knees begging God to make me a saint. Begging, 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 begging. From the bottom of my heart going, Lord, make me a saint. That's all I want. I don't want anything else. So the, the only way to defeat, to crush the snake, the only way will be to ask for sainthood. It's the only way. Because then the devil knows you have your foot on his head. You notice that... In Catholic uh, iconography, we have St. Saint, Saint Michael the Archangel stepping on the devil. And then we have Our Lady stepping on the snake, on the snake's head. But we always see the snake pretty much alive, right? The tongue out under the, 
under the foot of Our Lady. Satan is with the eyes open on the St. Michael, waiting to get away, right? And then this iconography is showing us these images. And, and usually a person that is not spiritual, is only religious, will be very thankful to St. Michael for stepping on that horrible devil. Don't let him come this way, okay? Thank you, St. Michael. And then Our Lady, she's so beautiful. She's stepping on the snake. I'm glad. Keep, keep the snake away from me. So this is usually a religious approach to, to, to the faith. But what they are teaching, what they are teaching us is step on it. That's what they're telling us. Hey, watch me, what I'm doing. This is what you have to do yourself. Step on the head of the snake because the snake is in you, right? Step on it and make sure your foot, make sure your foot is on it all the time, see? And this is the teaching of this iconography. But that is the difference between a religious person and a spiritual person. And a spiritual person says, thank you. Yes, I know what to do now. And I step on it, right? Because I know I have to do my job. It's me. It's me that I have to step on the snake. With the help of the celestial course. St. Michael will help me. Because he knows how to help me. And Our Lady will help me. But if they see me doing it, right? Because how could they help me if I don't want to step on it? So I have to step on it because it is flowing through me. That's why St. Paul says, there is a law in me that leads me to sin. The wrong I want to do is the wrong I end up doing. That is the snake. That is the devil. That is not me, but is in me. So therefore, I have to step on it so that I, ha I can subject that evil force to the Spirit of God and have control over it and don't let it control me. And this is exactly the work of the devil. The devil wants you not to ever even consider stepping on him. It's like many times, one time I was in a church in Ireland and uh, there were many people there and I, I was talking about the action of the fallen spirits in our life, which is practically the same talk I'm giving to you with the name of the devil. It's practically the same. It's evil forces against us. Obviously, we can get into different areas of hierarchies and, and, and look about the areas of temptation and how we are tempted and all of these things can vary. But the thing is that at the end, it's right at the very end of the talk, a woman fell almost on her face and began screaming. She had spirits, right? And the spirits began cursing me and calling me names. And they were even calling me nicknames from my elementary school. So I knew it was the devil, right? Because who will know that in Ireland? You know, like my nicknames in Colombia, in elementary school up in the Andes Mountains. Right? <laughs> Only a demon will know that. And they were cursing me like that. I know who you are. Why did you come? Why I curse you? I'm going to take revenge on you and your children and this and that. And they get you hurt. I mean, I was like this. I'm going like, no. Oh. But at the same time, <laughs> I, at the same time I was going, Lord, you got me into this. You better get me out of this, right? <laughs> I'm here only serving you, and now they're going to kill my children, right? So now, and, the, and the demons kept on cursing me and all of that. So the priest, the parish priest was sitting right here, right? And I go, Father, could you please go and do something about it? He said, oh, no, I don't deal with demons. So <laughs> I'm going, please go. Like, so this woman kept on just, uh, I mean, she was having convulsions on the ground. Everybody was intercepted by that. But I continued talking. And I finished the talk. And she never stopped. I mean, they never stopped. They were howling and crawling and making noises, screaming, crying, cursing, all kinds of things. And then she, she threw up, I mean, everything in the church. And I continued, finished the talk. And then at the end, when, we, when we, it was over, I told people, okay, now, could you please help this lady and bring her to the back? No! <laughs> well, and, then, and then they finally got her out, and the priest didn't want to deal with that. The priest disappeared. <laughs> disappeared, right? So we have to go to the back, and, I, and we, I told everybody, no one is going to pray a single prayer. We're going to be silent, and we're going to let this person calm down. We're going to be silent, very silent. And then everybody was silent. Nobody was speaking. And then he began to, to regain the peace, and then she came back to her senses. And then I learned something. You see, if you don't have the authority over demons, as we don't have, 
It has to be a priest and it has to be someone named by the bishop because this woman was possessed, right? You couldn't, you couldn't touch that. I mean, I don't have any authority to speak to so many demons that were talking to her, right? And then I don't have the authority to say, hey, call your boss because they all have a boss, you know, they, they have a prince from the dark because the spirits that are in a person are condemned souls. They are, they are demonized human beings that become slaves of that soul and are in obedience to a principality of the dark. And then only the church has the power to order these demons to call the chief, the boss that, that slaved them to that soul. And that prince of the dark is the only one that knows and has all the information why this was done against that soul. So when the prince comes and reveals all of that to the church, then the exorcist places an exorcist with all the information he received from the prince. And it says, I unchain whatever was done in such state, in such place, and at this time, all of this has to be done. So imagine, where can you get that authority? So the only thing I discovered is that when someone is like that, all you have to do is calm down, don't do anything, so the spirits don't attack, and then the person comes back to the senses, and then you diagnose the person and say, listen, you have serious spiritual problems, you need an exorcist. That is what you can do. It's like, in other words, we are like general physicians, you know? We, we, have, we are the ones that send the patients to the specialist, right? So we are to detect the demons, and then we don't deal with them and say, hey, by the way, you have a pan pan pancreatic problem. Go to the, <laughs> go to the specialist. <laughs> And, and we send them to wherever they belong, right? In according to what we find. We are able to diagnose that as, as laity and you as religious and, and, and regular plain priests that don't have any spirituality and are afraid of the devil, like this one that ran away, you know? <laughs> they, they are able to diagnose, you know? They don't have to deal with the demons, but at least they can tell this person where to go, you know? Which nowadays is very rare to find a diocese or archdiocese with, a, with an exorcist. They hardly anyone has. It's like the Pope is trying to, to get this going, but it's a very slow process. But at the same time, I notice that what happens is the devil has worked his way in the church for us to be without exorcists at this particular time of history, because he knew this is going to be one of the weakest times of the church. And then if the church is found in these wicked times without exorcist, it makes us even weaker. So that's why we have to pray so much for the healing of the church and for this renewal of the spirit so we can gain back our reverence to the blessed sacrament, to sacred traditions, to saint doctrine, and our obedience to hierarchy so that we can gain back the blessings. Because for us to have an exorcist, is a blessing, is a grace. It's like many times when I go to speak in Paris, people come around and say, why priests don't talk like you? I needed to hear this a long time ago. And I said,